And this will be the final lecture on the chemical properties of solids. In this lecture, I'm going to teach you guys about polymers. Speaking of Wyoming, I remember one time when I was living in Wyoming for a summer, I went uh, mountain biking at about 2 o'clock in the morning after I got done with both of my full-time jobs with my friends. And it was really exciting. There was nothing as amazing as going mountain biking with absolutely no light other than the light from the moon down a really, really steep and extraordinarily dangerous trail. Yeah, so as a teenager, I was an idiot. One of the times that we did that, I almost hit a moose. It was right in the middle of the, of the, my, of the trail or a little bit to one side. Fortunately, the trail was wide enough that I was able to pass right by it. I was going so fast that I don't think it even really paid much attention to me. And it's even possible I could have outrun it. I was hauling down this steep hill. I honestly could have punched the moose right in the nose. I was that close. If I'd done that, though, I suspect I probably would have regretted it. So with that said, we'll get back to talking about polymers, which happens to be the last type of solid that we'll discuss in this chapter. According to our text, polymers contain long chains of atoms where the atoms within a given chain are connected by covalent bonds and adjacent chains are held to one another largely by weaker intermolecular forces. Polymers are normally stronger and have higher melting points than molecular solids, and they are more flexible than metallic, ionic, or covalent network solids. Polymers are comprised of many, sometimes hundreds or even thousands of smaller molecules called monomers, all covalently bound together. Here are a few examples of some natural polymers. For example, DNA, the natural polymer that contains all of the molecules necessary to code for all of our physical traits, is made up of many small building blocks or monomers that are called nucleic acids. Proteins are made of building blocks or monomers called amino acids. Starch is made from smaller building blocks or monomers called glucose, and cellulose is made from smaller building blocks that is also glucose, just bound together in different ways. These are only a few of many examples of natural polymers. Polyethylene is an artificial polymer, and it's made from numerous repeating units of ethylene whose structure is shown here. Ethylene, by the way, is also called ethene. If you take many different molecules of ethylene and bond them all together in a huge chain, you get polyethylene, which is essentially, once again, a big, long chain of carbon atoms. Here's how that actually happens. If you can imagine two individual molecules of ethylene, also called ethene, and focus on the carbon-carbon double bond. As I've stated elsewhere, any time you have any bond, a line between two atoms on paper, that really represents two electrons being shared by those two atoms. If you can imagine one ethylene molecule taking one of those two electrons in this pi bond and flipping it to the left, and then the second of those two electrons and flipping it to the right, and doing that next to a neighboring molecule of ethylene, which also does the same thing, you can see that if I take one of these two electrons and put it over here, and then a second electron from this molecule and put it here, I can now combine those two electrons to form a single bond or sigma bond between these two carbon atoms. If that same thing happens between each of these ethylene molecules and a neighboring ethylene molecule to the right and left respectively, and then those molecules then do the same thing with two other molecules of ethylene in both directions in a theoretically limitless chain, you're going to get a huge molecule of polyethylene, which is essentially a big, long carbon chain. Our book shows us this cool slash semi-useless drawing that sort of depicts what that might look like in a three-dimensional-ish kind of way. So here are a few examples of commercial or synthetic polymers called addition polymers. Polyethylene is one of them that we've already looked at. Another one is called polypropylene. Notice that the only difference is that it's got this cute little CH3 group dangling off of the chain. Polystyrene has this six-membered ring, and each of these points in this uh, Hexagon represents a carbon atom that's got a double bond, then a single bond, then a double bond, then a single bond all the way around it. There are hydrogens attached to it as well. And this is an example called polyvinyl chloride, or PVC, in which I've got a chlorine appended to the chain. PVC, incidentally, is the material used in sprinkler pipe. The kind of sprinkler pipe that sucks gets frozen and then ruptures every springtime if you have it in your sprinkler system at your house and happen to live in a cold winter climate, like I do. Dang, we had to fix our sprinklers every single year. Here's a link that you're welcome to click on to a really cool video in which a guy talks more deeply about uh, polymers. And it's, it's really, really neat. And also by looking at it, I can see that he has a much more extensive production team and probably a larger budget than I do for mine. <laughs> so now I want to teach you how to determine what monomers are used in a given polymer. 
To identify a monomer used in an addition polymer, any of these kinds of polymers I just showed you, all we do is break apart the two sigma bonds at the right and the left of the repeating unit and then form a pi bond between the two carbon bonds in the middle, just like this. So once again, I've got any kind of addition polymer, such as polyethylene, polypropylene, PVC, or any of the others that I just showed you. If you're asked to determine what the monomer is that is used to construct this polymer, all you do is break the sigma bond over here to the left of this carbon, break the sigma bond over here to the right of this carbon, and then form a double bond between those two carbons, giving you this. Got it? Let's see if you can do it. Using table 12.5, which I showed you just two slides ago, please draw the structure of the monomers that would be used to form each of the following polymers. Okay, granted, I've only shown you one polymer here, but there's a part B and C to this question that I'll show you momentarily. Here are some examples of commercial or synthetic polymers that are called condensation polymers, which are a little bit different from addition polymers. Polyurethane has this structure. Polyethylene tetraphthalate, which is a polyester, nylon 6-6, and polycarbonate. Once again, you don't have to memorize these. I only want to show you because it's possible you may have heard of some of these and certainly have interacted with many of them. So to determine the monomers that are used in a condensation polymer, it's a little bit trickier. Nylons are made by reacting a diamine, shown here, with a diacid chloride, shown here. Here's what happens. A diamine is any molecule that has two amines in it. Amines are NH2 groups. And a diacid chloride, an acid chloride is something that has a carbon double bonded to an oxygen with a chlorine coming off of it. A diacid chloride is one that has two of those. These R groups just represent any type of carbon chain in the middle of these two ends. When you take a diamine and react it with a diacid chloride, what occurs is they combine to form this in a repeating unit. The diamine part goes in here, and the nitrogens basically take the place of the chlorines on the diacid chloride in a repeating unit again and again and again. So the nitrogens in this process each lose one hydrogen and take the places of the chlorines in the diacid. This is called a nylon polymer. Here, by the way, is a really cool link to a neat video that also happens to be a commercial for a company that provides materials to make this, showing you an example of how to make a nylon. I think it's really cool and worthwhile watching, so please click on it if you'd like to see it. Polyesters are similar to nylons, except that they involve oxygen atoms instead of nitrogens. If I start with a diol, it looks just like a diamine, except instead of NH2s on the ends, it's got OHs on the ends, and I react it with diacid chloride. Now, please keep in mind this R group represents some kind of carbon chain. It could be one carbon long, it could be many carbons long, and it could have all kinds of branches in it or not. It depends on the individual polymer. If you react these two together, just like the nylons we saw in the previous slide, they can form this type of polymer where I've got the oxygens taking the places of the chlorines in the diacid chlorides in a repeating unit over and over and over. Just like with the nitrogen, the oxygens each lose a hydrogen and then replace the chlorines on the diacid. This is what the generic structure of a polyester looks like. That takes us to a question. Using 12.5, which I showed you a few slides ago and is also found on page 493 of your text, draw the structure of the monomers employed to form each of the following polymers. Now, I'm not going to show you the answer to this question here, but we'll post a link to a separate video in which I do. That takes us to the end of this video and the end of our discussion of Chapter 12 and the end of our first semester of general chemistry. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. Until next semester and next time, have an enjoyable rest of your life and day.